Wow, it is so good to be here this morning. The last time I was here was four years ago. I had the privilege of meeting a number of you, worshiping with a number of you, and we have remembered and thought of so many of you. And with all the changes you guys have gone through since the last time we were here, we want you to know that we have been actively praying for you as a church, for your families, and for your ministry here. We're so thankful for you. And, and I was invited to preach, but honestly, I feel like I don't need to because all those songs just preach to me. My soul is full. I needed to, to preach to myself and have your voices preach to me those very things this morning. Another thing I love about, I could go on and on about what I love about your church. One of the things I love about your church is you're so incredibly hospitable uh, to outsiders such as, our, as ourselves. And, and secondly, I preach in churches, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 times a year. Uh, and it is very rare that I hear people singing out like so many of you sang out today. So for my soul, it was encouraging to hear your voices preaching the gospel to me. So I guess I will preach anyway, because otherwise this will be a very short gathering, right? Uh, on September 19th, 1985, Mexico City experienced the worst earthquake in all of its history. 412 buildings completely fell 3,000 buildings more were severely damaged so that they couldn't be used again. Over 5,000 image bearers lost their lives on that day. People in Mexico City still live with that day at the very forefront of their minds. Whether they were alive or not, the images of that day are ingrained in every fiber of their being. For that reason, Mexico City was the very first city in all of the world to invent a seismic alert system wherein they put these little speakers on every telephone pole in the city so that you hear this alert that essentially tells you, do something, an earthquake is coming, and you have about 30 seconds to decide what you're going to do. But there's a 30-second sounding alert before the ground begins to shake. When my family and I arrived in Mexico City in 2015, uh, we were foolish. I didn't know we were foolish at the time, but, but we would hear that alert and we would be like, uh, I'm tired, let's stay in bed, right? Our, 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 our apartment's on the fifth floor, so we would just be like, oh, I want to stay in here, everything's going to be just fine. Uh, we quickly learned how foolish we were when exactly 32 years to the day, on September 19th, 2017, Mexico City experienced the second worst earthquake in its history, lives were lost, buildings fell, and terror struck the city. Our neighbors, our friends, our church members, they didn't need that object lesson to remind them to take those seismic alerts seriously, right? They knew that when that alarm sounded, their life was at stake and they had to do something. Even if 90 times out of 100, uh, what was to follow wasn't all that serious. But they knew what we didn't know. Now we know, but they knew what we didn't know. And so they tended and still tend to respond in one of two ways. Remember, you only have 30 seconds. But with those 30 seconds, most of our friends either try to run out of their building as fast as they can or find a piece of furniture sufficiently large enough that they can crouch under it and just pray that as everything comes crumbling down around them that this will be strong enough to protect them. Now, here in San Jose, right, we don't have this wonderful seismic alert system that tells us, yo, you got 30 seconds, get ready. I wish we would because the last time we were here, we stayed at Eleanor's house and we experienced a San Jose earthquake for the first time. No, it was great. Yeah. Your house stood and, and nothing fell on us. It was magnificent. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what it's like, right, to hear that sound and, and know, okay, my life could potentially be at stake. I have 30 seconds to do something about it. We don't know what it's like to have all those images of past destruction flood into our minds as we hear that sound and the trauma that goes with it. But we do know what it's like to hear, a, a, for lack of a better word, a, a metaphorical seismic alert in our lives, right? We know what it's like to begin to feel, whether it's spiritually or relationally or, or emotionally or physically, we know what it's like to, to, to feel, just have the sense that our life or our world is about to shake, right? 
And we might hear that, that seismic alert in, in unexpected challenges or changes in our romantic relationships. We might hear it in an unwelcome diagnosis for ourselves or for someone that we love. You might feel it with the sudden loss of income or with financial struggles. We might hear that, that seismic alert in the betrayal of trust on, by, uh, on behalf of someone that we had depended on and thought we could depend upon. We might hear that seismic alert in the sense of, of disappointments and surprises and frustrations with a child or with our parents or with any other family member. We might even hear that seismic alert with the loss of a pastor and the changes that that includes and uncertainty that that includes. However we hear it, right? just like my friends in Mexico City, we have to choose whether we're going to trust in our own strength to get us out of trouble as quickly as possible or whether we're going to trust in the strength of something else to keep us safe no matter what happens or how hard things come crashing down around us. Roughly 2,500 years ago, Jeremiah sounded an alarm for his people who found themselves in exactly the same situation as you. Now, historically, it's different, but the feelings are the same. The world around them was going through immense change. Egypt and Babylon were caught up in this constant struggle for who was going to be the dominant power in that part of the world. And right in the middle of these two immense forces is this little tiny nation of Judah being pulled from one side to the other. To make matters worse, King Josiah, the righteous king of their people, had recently died. And all of the leaders who came after were morally, spiritually, politically corrupt. They find themselves in a terrible situation, and the combination of these events would eventually lead to their holy city being destroyed, right? to them being exiled from the place that they believed was God's promised land to them, and then being taken captive and forced to live under the rule of a pagan empire. Now, before, and during, and after these events, Jeremiah, sent by God himself, repeatedly sounded the seismic alarm. The ground is about to shake, he kept telling them. An earthquake is coming, and here's what you need to do, he told them over and over again, in order to survive. Well, the words that God spoke through Jeremiah to Judah as their earth was, was shaking, God also speaks to us through Jeremiah today as our ground is shaking or perhaps preparing to shake. And if I had to summarize it just so we have something to hang all of our thoughts on today, I would summarize it in this way. When you hear the alarm, be very, very careful about where you look for safety. When we hear the alarm, we must be very careful about where we look for safety. Let's start in Jeremiah 17. If you have a Bible, you can open to Jeremiah chapter 17. And let's listen to how God communicates this because what God has to say to us today about where we should look for our safety when that alarm starts to sound, we're going to see it's, it's truly the difference between life and death. We're going to start in verses 5 and 6 of Jeremiah 17. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. We're going to look at more of the passage, but for now we're going to stop here. When you hear the alarm, be very, very careful about where you look for safety. In this passage, God is warning us of the, the severe dangers of responding to this alarm by holding trusting in man, holding on to the strength of men for our safety and our deliverance. Now, in the historical context of, of Jeremiah 17, um, Judah right, was being tempted to trust in their human political leaders to guarantee their safety. They were being tempted to trust in political treaties between Judah and Egypt and Babylon to let them know that their, their life as they knew it would not be utterly destroyed. They were tempted to trust even in their own righteousness, even in their own 
ethnicity to say, even if suffering comes, I mean, we're God's people. We're not going to suffer as bad as the rest. And God says, guys, you're right to be concerned. You have every right to be scared. Um, I mean, he's the one who's sounding the alarm, right? He's the one who's telling them the earth is going to shake. But yet he warns them, the way you're trying to deal with that fear, the way you're trying to hold on to your safety, the way you're trying to not let everything destroy you as it falls around you is the very thing that's going to destroy you. It will, in fact, he says, curse you. That's pretty severe. Why would God say to his people, you are cursed if you trust in man? You are cursed if you choose to trust in the strength of men. The key is right there in verse 5, right? The consequences are so severe because to trust in man to deliver us from the shaking earth is to turn our trust away from the Lord. In the same way that running out of the building when I hear the seismic alarm means I cannot at the same time throw myself under a piece of furniture in hopes of protecting me. The moment I make this choice to do this, I have turned my heart, my back, on the other. God says the moment you choose to trust in man, you have done a 180 and you cannot simultaneously trust in me. And I'm just going to speak for myself. When I use we here, uh, and I'll use we throughout our time together today, I'm really just talking about me. I hope it applies to you as well. Otherwise, I'm especially wicked, and maybe I am. But, but if it doesn't apply to you, just think, oh, well, Cole, Cole has a problem, all right? This is hard for us to accept um, because it feels so, so right. It feels like the wise thing to do. Just like when... When I hear those alarms in Mexico City now, what feels like the wise thing to do is to run out of the apartment building as fast as I can. And yet, just as the Red Cross will tell me that that's the worst, least safe thing that I can actually do when that alarm goes off, God says to me, the worst and least safe thing that you can do when you hear that metaphorical alert in your life is to run and try to put your trust in your strength or in the strength of other human beings. God goes on to describe the effects. What happens when we trust in man instead of trusting in the Lord, he shows us what this cursed existence looks like. He says we will be like a bush in the wastelands, basically like a bush here in San Jose, right? Does it ever rain here? Have you ever seen green? <laughs> we will not see prosperity when it comes. We will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. In other words... The imagery is saying we won't experience life, right? We'll be barren, we'll be unproductive, we'll be desperately thirsty, but there will be nothing to quench that thirst. If prosperity comes, and prosperity will come, this text says it will just skip over us. And when the scorching heat of suffering comes, and that comes, we will have no shade to guard us from the pain of that scorching heat and we will just be burned up by the flames of suffering. We're not in the same historical position as Judah, but we're vulnerable to respond in the same way as Judah. We too trust in men. We too draw our strength from mere flesh, whether it's ours or someone else's, right? If we're worried about the, the condition of our country, or the current condition of, of our city, we might trust in a particular politician, right? Or in a particular political party to, to keep us safe and make everything right again. And those who support other politicians or other political parties then become our enemies because they're a direct threat, we see, to our safety or to the safety of those we love. If we are married, we might trust our spouse to be our firm ground when the world shakes, which is a weight that our spouses cannot bear. Or... If we're not happy with how our spouse functions when the world shakes, we might trust in someone outside of our marriage to be for us what we think our spouse has failed to be. If we are single, we might be tempted to think, you know, if I just had the right person, 
my ground would be more firm and I would be secure. If we are parents, we might trust in our children to make us feel valuable, to, to give life, uh, to, excuse me, to give, to give our meaning life and, and, and purpose. Others of us might look to our, our parents, our teachers, our boss, our pastors, our peers to define our worth and what we contribute to the world when our finances or our business is shaky. We might turn to human strategies to try to rectify the damage, right? When life is unpredictable and scary, we might turn to manipulative and and passive aggressive behaviors to try to gain some measure of control. When our church fails to reach the people we think we should reach, we might turn to changing the music or changing the children's ministry or, 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 or changing the website or changing the preaching instead of turning first to the only God who actually changes hearts. When our church loses its pastor, we might fear that God's blessing has gone with them or we might fear for the church's future or, or our future might be even dependent on making sure we find absolutely the right pastor, the right human being to take his place and keep God's church safe. In any and all of these situations and so many more, we are trusting in people. And the moment that we turn to human beings to be our safety when the world shakes, we turn our hearts away from the Lord. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. The ground is going to shake. That's not up for debate. But when you hear the alarm, be very careful about where you look for safety. The good news, there is an alternative. Instead of running out of the shaking building in your own strength, trying to save yourself, you can throw yourself down underneath something a little stronger, a little firmer than you are, and you can trust in it to keep you safe. In this case, that thing is not just a little stronger, it is eternally strong, and it is none other than the Lord himself. Look at verses 7 and 8. In 7 and 8, God, through Jeremiah, says, but, he's making a contrast here, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. Again, we'll look at more of this passage, but for now, we're going to pause here. When you hear the alarm, be very careful about where you look for safety. Because while trusting in man leads to a curse, Choosing to trust in the Lord when the ground shakes leads to great, great blessing, right? You'll remember that God already said the person who trusts in man is like a a bush in the wastelands, right? It has no water. It's dried out. It can't bear fruit. And he says the one who trusts in the Lord is like a tree whose leaves are always green because it's always connected to the water. The person who trusts in man, you'll remember when the heat comes, it has nothing to shade it or shield it. It says here that the tree of the one who trusts in the Lord never has to worry about the scorching heat of suffering, which comes on both he who trusts in the Lord and he who trusts in man, because the one who trusts in the Lord has these beautiful leaves of green, these roots rooted in the water to keep it from drying out and being burned up even when the heat comes. The person who trusts in the Lord is safe. The person who trusts in the Lord bears fruit. The person who trusts in the Lord can handle the fires of suffering. The person who trusts in the Lord then is, as the scripture says, blessed. And the difference really could not be more dramatic when the ground of faith starts to shake, the thing that feels most safe, right? Trying to get it under control yourself, trying to minimize the damage yourself, that is the thing that's going to curse you. And the thing that feels most risky, staying right there as everything around you falls to the ground, but hiding under someone or something else, is actually the thing that will bless you in every way. The reason that Red Cross tells me Don't run out of the building. Throw yourself under a piece of furniture when you hear that alarm is because it works. The reason God tells you, don't trust in man, don't trust in your own strength or the strengths of others, trust in me is because it works. He actually can shield you. 
He actually can protect you. He actually is the one and only firm foundation. He is the one and only thing that will not be shaken no matter how much, whoops, the iPad, I can't trust in that, no matter how much the ground shakes, you see the Lord is still here standing firm. He is the only one. He is the only one. He tells you trust in him because it works. Only God can be trusted with the weight of your marriage. Only God can be trusted with the weight of your singleness. Only God can be trusted with the weight of your financial problems or business problems. Only God can be trusted with your identity and your human need to feel valued and worthy. Only God can be trusted to control what otherwise is utterly uncontrollable. Only God can be trusted with your church's failures. Only God can be trusted with your church's successes. Only God can be trusted with your church leadership. Only God can be trusted with your church. There is no question that the ground is going to shake. You might already be feeling it. Just be very careful about where you run to for safety. Trusting in man will curse you and make you vulnerable to things you don't even want to dream of. Even in the face of prosperity, it will pass over you. Whereas trusting in the Lord will protect you even in the face of the worst of the worst suffering. It could not be more plain. It could not be more plain. And I would love to just uh, wrap it up right here and say, stop trusting in man, start trusting the Lord, and we're good. But it's not that easy. There is a problem. The problem is, as much as you and I can easily affirm, yeah, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Yeah, cursed is the one who trusts in man. If the scripture is our authority, we must also affirm a third thing, and this is where it gets tricky. Hopeless are we to know the difference. Look at verses 9 and 10 of that same passage of Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. This is God's word. In other words, we, we may think that we're trusting in the Lord, but we're not qualified to make that assessment. Has anybody ever gone on WebMD and typed in, I don't know, your two to four symptoms before? And you get back your report of 493 terrifying things that you might have. And one or two really simple things that you're praying, it's that thing. You are more likely to accurately diagnose yourself out of that list of 492 options than you are to accurately diagnose whether you are actively trusting in the Lord or trusting in man. Certainly the people of Judah were convinced they were trusting in the Lord even as Jeremiah was rebuking them for doing the opposite. Certainly David was convinced he was trusting in the Lord when he took the census of Israel. Certainly Peter was convinced he was trusting in the Lord when he was like, nah, Jesus, you ain't going to die. Nobody's going to hurt you. Certainly you and I can just as easily be convinced that we are trusting in the Lord when from God's perspective, we're not trusting the Lord with our marriage or our singleness or our prosperity or our suffering or our children or our job or our provision or our value or our church or our church leadership. And just like those who came before us, with all of our certainty that we're trusting in the Lord, we may be dead wrong. Amen. And this is really bad news for us. Uh, since the difference between a correct diagnosis and an incorrect diagnosis is the difference between a cursed life and a blessed life. So how can we know? Right? How can we truly know if we are trusting the Lord, which will lead to blessing, or trusting in man, which will lead to curse? How do we know that, that our diagnosis is correct? Our only hope, our only hope is to let the Lord do the diagnosing. Remember what he said in verse 10? He said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I, the Lord, examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. 
I hate going to the doctor. Like, I hate it, all right? But I have to go. I hate going because of the fear of what they might tell me. I have never gone to the doctor and received good news. Have you ever received good news from a doctor? I think it's impossible. You never go to the doctor and they take your blood and they say, oh, good news, Um, you have x-ray vision. Good news, you can fly. That's never what you hear from the doctor. You hear good news, you're not dead yet. Come see me in six weeks, six months, and eventually I'll tell you that you have a deadly illness. That's The best case scenario of going to the doctor, I hate going, and yet I have to go. Why do I go? Because I know that the one time where they finally do tell me, there's something here we have to address. My only hope of survival is if they tell me, right? I need the correct diagnosis in order to be able to save, to to be saved from the consequences of whatever it is that's going on in my body. And so the proper response, as much as we might fear that God says, brother, you're trusting in man. As much as we might fear that God points out to us that our trust in the Lord is not as convincing or real as we thought it was, a correct diagnosis, as painful as it might be, is our only hope to actually receive the healing we want. And so the proper response is not to avoid his light and convince ourselves, no, I'm good, I'm trusting the Lord, I know I'm good. It is to allow ourselves to be naked before him, to turn to him and say, Lord, you're the only one who really knows what's going on in here. Please shine a light on my heart and reveal where I am failing to trust in you. Please affirm me where I am trusting in you and please reveal where I'm failing to trust in you. I can't even trust in man to tell me what's wrong. You're the only one who can diagnose me. In fact, if it's okay with y'all, there's a little bit more that we're going to talk about. But before we do that, can we, can we invite God to do that together right now? Let's, let's pray and invite God to do that right now. Father, in the name of Christ, blessed is he who trusts in man. Curse, pardon me, blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Cursed is he who trusts in man. And hopeless are we to know the difference. God, we ask you as the only one who can rightly diagnose our hearts to show us Are we trusting in you truly with these things that that scare us, with these things we're anxious about, with these things we're uncertain about? We invite you, Lord, to show us the truth. We invite you to shine a light on the darkest parts of our soul and our heart. Search me and know me as the psalmist prayed. Speak to us, Lord. God, whether it be right in this moment, whether it be through the rest of our time together today, or whether it be sometime this week, we we ask you that you would graciously, powerfully show us the truth. We don't want to keep walking in blindness to what our heart is really trusting in. We want to know, and so we turn to you. Amen. I want to talk with you all a little bit from personal experience. If we sincerely pray that prayer to him, he's going to show us. That's not up for debate. Um, But what he shows you might be painful. It might even be humiliating. Speaking from experience, you might find that the area or areas where you are failing to trust in the Lord are the areas where you were most certain and confident in how much you were trusting in the Lord. That can be humiliating. But I can also promise you from personal experience that though it might be painful and though it might be humiliating, it will not be hopeless. Never, ever, ever. Why? Jeremiah himself shows us how we can respond to the fact that our hearts are deceitful above all things and beyond cure. In verse 14 of that same text, after God has said that he's the only one who can diagnose the heart, this is how Jeremiah responds to that in verse 14. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. 
for you are the one I praise. If we try to hide the truth about our incurable hearts, we're trying to run out of that building in our own strength. We're trusting in men. If we try to, to get our wayward heart under control in our own power, we are once again trusting in human strength. If we turn to a politician or a church leader or a church program to make this thing better, we are trusting in man. The only hope to cure a heart that is trusting in man is to trust in God and God alone to fix it. You don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of any diagnosis because we have a great physician who can cure even the most incurable of hearts. If we turn to him to diagnose us, we are turning to him. If we turn to him to cure us, we are turning to him. The very act of doing this is itself an act of redirecting our hearts to the only one in whom we ought to place our trust. And blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And what better way to demonstrate our trust in him than to go to him and say, we don't have any idea what's going on here, but we know you're the only one who can fix it. We trust in you. So let us cry out, right, with Jeremiah for both internal salvation and external, the shaking ground salvation. That's what Jeremiah prays. He says, he says, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Deal with this right here, God. Save me, Lord, and I will be saved. Save me from all this shaking and crashing down around me. Do both. Work in here and protect me out here. Whether in your marriage or in your singleness, your prosperity or your poverty, your parenting or your studying, your job or your finances, your emotional fulfillment or your, um, your personal satisfaction, your church or your church leaders, I promise you the ground is going to shake. And you probably don't need me to tell you that. But when you hear the alarm, be very careful about where you run, where you look, what you trust in for your safety. It feels so right to try to take control and make it a safe space yourself. But if you do, you're actually much more likely to be harmed. Your safety is found in trusting in something stronger than you to keep you even as everything around is crashing down hard and frightening. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. And hopeless are we to know the difference. Jeremiah summarizes it all, Park. Jeremiah summarizes it all to conclude in verse 13. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Our only hope, my friends, is the Lord. If we turn from him, we turn from the living water, the living water that satisfies us, the living water that gives us life, the living water that empowers us to endure those times of dryness and heat and scorching and pain. And the good news is that even if we have turned from the living water, and I'm going to dare to say that every single one of us in this room has in one area or more of our lives, we have turned away from the living water and turned to trust in the strength of man. That is very bad news. The good news is that there is an escape from the eternal consequences of having trusted in man, from the eternal consequences of having let our hearts wander from the source of the living water. And that is this, though we have turned from the living water, the living water has not once, not for one second, turned from us. He has come to us. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, says, whoever believes in me, to use the language of Jeremiah, whoever trusts in me, rivers of living water will flow from them. We can and should trust in Jesus, the perfect living water, because Jesus, the perfect living water, has already trusted in the Lord for us, on our behalf. When we see 
a potential escape from our discomfort, we quickly trust in that potential escape instead of in the Lord. But when the devil offered to Jesus a very real escape from his very severe discomfort, his response was to trust in the Lord even as he remained in his discomfort. He did that for you on your behalf. When our future looks dark, we turn to man to try to get ourselves out of it. When Jesus' future looked far darker, he set his face toward Jerusalem and trusted in the Lord for you, for you, for you me. When his ground literally shook underneath his feet, he didn't respond like we do when our ground figuratively shakes. No, we turn from God and run to the safety of men. But Jesus, as his ground literally shook, cried out, my God, my God, Even when he felt most forsaken by him, he still turned and trusted only in him. My God, my God. And he did that for you. So that his trusting of the Lord, his flawless, perfect trusting in the Lord would count as your perfect, flawless trusting in the Lord. He did it in your place And he also did it for your benefit, not just so that you would be considered as though you had always trusted in the Lord, but so that you could be filled with the very same Holy Spirit who empowered Jesus to trust in the Lord in those most frightening times. You now have the same Spirit dwelling in you if your faith is in Christ Jesus. You have everything you need to not just know that you are forgiven of the eternal consequences of your failure to trust in the Lord, but that you presently have the power to turn away from all your human strategies of safety and protection and to trust, as Jesus did, in the Lord and his faithfulness. When the alarm sounds, right? When the ground starts to shake. Why would we look anywhere else but to him? Let's pray. Jesus, Thank you that you trusted perfectly for us. We're reminded this morning of how easy it is for us to not respond in that way. And yet you endured a suffering that we can't even imagine. And you never failed to trust. Thank you, Jesus, for trusting in our place. We ask you to form in us hearts that reflect your heart. When things in our relationships when things in our provision, when things in our church, when things in our lives, when things in our health are shaky and uncertain, may our hearts trust in the Father as your heart trusted perfectly in the Father. We pray this in the name of your Son. We pray this in, the name, in your name, Jesus. Amen.